Hello, we're just going to give it a few minutes for other people to join and then I'll start. So a few more people join, we'll just give it one more minute and then I'll get started. Okay, so let's get started. Let me share. Okay, can uh, everyone see that fine? Okay, I got a thumbs up, good. So I guess we can just get started then. So, hello, my name is Ashwin. I'll introduce myself a little bit more coming up, but I'm a first year medical student at McMaster University specifically the Hamilton campus. And I'll just be, I'm a consultant with Accepted Together, of course, and I'll be giving a seminar that I called Intersecting the Interview. So, some important information starting off. Yeah, like it, you may have noticed as well, the seminars can be recorded and uploaded later. So for anyone that wasn't able to make it, they'll be able to just look at the recording in a little bit. And, I will, of course, be mentioning my packages, but I'll save that at the very end because 
of course, the information will come first. And if you have any follow-up questions or just anything at all, you can definitely reach out to my consultant page at acceptedtogether.com. You can just search my name and that'll come up and you can message me and we can talk further afterwards as well. So just a little bit of an agenda as well. It's just to see what's gonna happen throughout. Uh, first, I'm just gonna introduce myself, give some information on the interviews, what they look like for both panel and MMI, just to give a little basis of information because a lot of people might be hearing back around this time and not really know what the interviews might look like. I'll give some general strategies that would help like regardless of exactly what type of interview you're doing. Then focus a little bit more specifically on panel interviews and again, focusing more specifically on MMIs. And also just a quick note at the end as well about the, the virtual MPI that I know some schools are doing specifically UFT. I'll mention that when I get to that. And finally, just some important questions, of course, to consider when prepping for the interview. And finally, finally I'll have that shameless plug about my packages offered. So first about me, I did my undergrad at Western. So I had a relatively, actually a, a very tra uh, traditional route. I went through high school, then went to undergrad at Western, pursued medical sciences. I did the, uh, in my third year, I was accepted at McMaster's Medical School. So I wasn't able to completely finish my undergraduate degree, but I did my third year in medical. Uh, medical sciences with the microbiology and immunology mo module. Just a little bit more about me and my hobbies. I like to read. I've been cooking more, just trying to meal prep a little bit and kind of experimenting with recipes that have gotten me into cooking more. Uh, playing video games, hanging out with friends and trying to, especially when I'm with friends, trying new places to eat, especially since I am new to Hamilton being a Western student. One of the first things I definitely wanted to try when I got to Hamilton was all the different food that was available. And so that was a great way to experience Hamilton as well. So just getting right into it, what the interviews will look like. First of all, a bit of information. First of all, looking at the panel, of course, you will be the interview in that situation. The panel itself may look like the exact number varies a little bit. I think the regular number is more so like three to four, maybe even a little bit more sometimes. However, normally what that panel will look like will have medical faculty. So professors and such actually teaching at the medical school. There may be current students that it's sometimes, that's a little more inconsistent, but typically this upper course will be upper year students, more so at the tail end of their medical school uh, career and also residents as well with that school. So they may, or, they may or may not, actually I'm pretty sure they most likely would have done their medical schooling at that school and would just be continuing the residency within that school's programs as well. And I put up a bit of a sub note here about non-medical persons. That's also a little bit iffy, but sometimes there may be an individual that's not directly in medicine, like a medical student or resident. They may be like a, still a very important role, such as maybe like community worker that can give a little bit of extra perspective just to have a little bit more of a holistic panel. So the questions that will be asked on the panel interview, these are these can range anywhere from questions about your CV, they may ask directly, more personal questions, those kinds of, you know, tell us about a time when you struggled or had a conflict, things like that, ethical questions that may range from simple kind of like, what do you do in this situation given like, let's say you have to choose between like uh, two different friends to side with in a conflict, or maybe even more grander ethical questions like that kind of leads into healthcare as well. Like if you are debating on certain parts like such as pro-life or being pro-life or against that, like what are the ethical implications of something like that? They can be a little bit intense depending on the school, but I think it's definitely important just to look a little bit into that. And finally, healthcare questions, a little bit very tied in with the ethical usually but it might be a little bit related to the population that the medical school may be helping. Like if they help a certain, uh, have a certain patient population, they may have questions related to that as well. 
And I put a note here about it becoming less common because some more schools, for example, uh, McMaster, UFP and such are adopting more of an MMI situation. This might be a little bit more common in the US, but I think in Canada, is starting to switch a little bit more to like MMIs and things like that, which is definitely why I wanted to have some information on the MMI. So this is a little bit of a newer form of interview. Instead of a panel where there, you might be talking to a few people at a time, these will be more so one-to-one. -one. And what these will look like is the, the people evaluating you will be similar to what the panel would look like. So it'll be more of an upper year medical student, faculty, residents, and so on. Maybe also extra, again, like I mentioned, maybe a non-healthcare worker as well could potentially, if they're kind of involved with the medical school already. The exact number of stations may vary, but a typical number is about eight stations where you'll be talking to someone. And that also includes about maybe two rest stations. So when you get to the station, there won't be a question to answer. You may be by yourself or with another medical student just to kind of debrief with them a little bit before you move on. And again, the questions asked will be more so on the personal, ethical, and healthcare side. They may not directly ask you about your CV, but they could ask very personal questions that, of course, would have you draw on your previous experiences, both in your life and also just like extracurricular and things like that. Again, health, ethical and healthcare questions may come up. So they're definitely good to practice that a little bit beforehand. And just getting into kind of general strategies and tips beforehand, one thing that's really important I find is of course preparation. It sounds a little silly, but also it is something even for the MMI that you may hear that you can't really prepare for it too much. But I think especially with interviews, the most important thing you could do to prepare is not knowing exactly how to answer every single question, but knowing that regardless of the question I'll be asked, you have a solid foundational strategy that you'll use. So even if a question is a little bit different and you're like, oh, I haven't really prepared for this exactly, it's a little bit different from what I'm used to, you still know that I'll approach this the same way I'll approach any other question and I'll use the strategies I've been practicing and so I can approach it well and not have to, and not end up rambling throughout your answer because while, of course, preparation is important, there will still be an element of the questions that they ask may be a little bit more unorthodox. And so not only preparing for slightly unorthodox questions, but also being able to know that on the day of you have a strategy that you use, even if they give you a question that you may not have been expecting. So in order to actually go about developing these strategies, one thing that's especially important is having your prep group. So when I was applying, and was interviewing at Big Master. I didn't really have a, and I didn't really know a lot, of people, a lot of people preparing with me at the same time. So reaching out to places like that are very common, like pre-med Canada, Reddit, like Discord and such things like that. I was able to kind of just put a posting on the pre-med Canada Reddit, just, oh, I'm looking to prepare for some people for like MMIs and interviews and such. And so that I, oh, Someone's saying they can't see the slides. Huh, I just realized this is not, the slide not been changing. Hold on, <laughs> that would be a little embarrassing. I thought the slide should have been changing with the view, hold on. Okay, I did not realize the slide was not changing, unfortunately. I thought it was, it was on my screen, but I realized that was not actually changing. So, I mean, the, there wasn't, okay. So I guess briefly to go back through the slides, it was pretty much what I was talking about already. So the,
Hello, I am very sorry about that. My Zoom just decided to completely crash on me. So I will quickly restart. I hopefully this will resolve the slide transition error. I on my screen the slides were changing, but for some reason it was not changing on the Zoom share screen. But me open that up again. <laughs> Sorry again about that. I'll hopefully can readjust. I can also see if the slideshow can be shared afterwards as well, just to get so just for people that may have not been able to see that. Let me make sure. Okay. Okay, yeah, yeah. okay, now it's changing. So Really quickly to briefly go back through what I was talking about. So again, the important information, I think it's a standard with seminars. So if you've been to one before, you'll see this, but again, it's gonna be recorded and I'll shamelessly plug my packages at the end. The agenda I talked about here, just going through what I'm gonna be talking about. <laughs> the slide that was about me, I'll skim through again. So I did three years at Western at Medical Sciences. And again, my hobbies, reading, being like I said, I was doing meal prep and especially trying new places to eat. So the interview panel, the hope, I wish the slide was actually showing so you could have gotten visualized that better. But again, the panel will consist about four to five ish people. Again, it could range from medical faculty to current students, residents, or even non medical persons. But I put a question mark here because sometimes it's a little bit iffy on if there'll be non-medical persons or even current students. And again, the question is asked from CV. They'll straight up, they may ask you directly about your CV, your personal questions, like what would you do in certain situations, ethical and healthcare, those kind of tie into each other a lot. So they, you might see an ethical question about a healthcare topic. And I have the note about it being less common because normally they're especially in Canada, they've been switching more to an MMI kind of situation. And so back to this slide that we were on about the information on the MMI. So a little bit newer, there'll be one-to-one, -one. again, upper year medical students, faculty, residents and such. And what that'll look like is you'll walk into a station, you they'll give you a prompt and you have maybe about two minutes, it varies slightly, depending on the school, but it'll be about two minutes to think about it. And then roughly about seven, eight minutes just to talk. But that also includes follow-up questions. So I will, when I get to the MMI specific information, I'll talk about the timing a little bit better. And again, the questions asked range from personal, ethical, and healthcare. So back to the slide that was supposed to be on. Thanks for also bringing that up about not seeing the slide because that would have been awful with the whole hour and the slide never changed. So back to this point again, to summarize what was said, again with preparing, definitely know your application. It's really important that regardless of the situa uh, situation you're in, there you may not always have something from your previous experience that you can draw into the situation or the question asked, but if you do, that's definitely good to bring up. Like, of course, there'll be obvious questions where if you're talking about a time you had conflict, then of course you should use a previous example. But if you're maybe talking about something that's not as direct, maybe it's an ethical question. You can still tie into things like, oh, you know, I've, maybe you've done a course on ethics. Maybe you've been involved in some kind of planning where you had other like ethical dilemmas, even if they weren't that severe, just to, help convey a little bit of your own personality and your own interests there can definitely help. And with finding a prep group, again, like I mentioned, pre-med, Canada, Discord and such can really help with finding a prep group. That's I you had to use the pre-med Canada, like I said before, because I didn't know a lot of people preparing with me. So that really helped me to have a steady group to prep with. And one of the biggest things you can do during prep is experimenting with strategies. So I'll mention actually one specific strategy as well during this, as well as just general tips as well. One thing that I definitely have come to both appreciate and not like about interview prepping 
is that it is more of an art than a science. So you can have multiple people answer the same question differently and with different strategies. And you can all say that they're giving really, they could all necessarily give really good answers. So I think looking into different kinds of ways to experiment with strategies, seeing what's out there, and even just looking it up. People, a lot of people on, for example, I mentioned Prima Canada, read it again, will may give explicit strategies. Very early on, obviously it's better, but you can experiment at any point if you want to. And I have a point here about required readings. So uh, th this is a little bit of a mixed, uh, mixed opinion topic. There may be some people saying that they really like read certain books and they really like learned them inside and out and that really helped. And there'll be some people that never read a page of any book related to interview prep and they still got it. I think I'm a little bit in the middle where if you have no knowledge on a certain topic, maybe it wouldn't hurt to just look into something a little bit, just to get a little bit of a basis. So if they're talking about an important topic that's relevant to the school, maybe the school is really involved, for example, in indigenous healthcare and kind of that kind of thing. Just having a little bit of background information would still help to bring in to show that not only you know the school, but you're also interested in those topics as well. And a lot of people will also cite like, I think, I don't remember exactly what the ethical book was called. I think it was called Doing Right, I think. But it was a very like commonly thrown around ethical book, which will just have chapters on like what the ethics are, certain cases and stuff. I did enjoy, I did find it interesting, but at the same time, it, it wasn't the big, like it didn't really make or break my interview prep. It's more so if you're interested in the topic, read about it, but don't feel like you have to read it in order to do well on the interview, because it's definitely not true. And one thing that's special, I definitely want to push just regardless of your interview prep is your own self-care. So interview prepping, even if you're not given as much time, because sometimes schools may give you months, sometimes may give you uh, three weeks, two weeks. I don't think you'll only have, hopefully, a school will get back to you with more than one week. But even regardless of how much time you have, that interview prep will take multiple sessions and multiple hours of preparing and experimenting and refining. So there is no reason to try to burn through that, spend so many hours a week to try to uh, perfect your strategy when you could better spend that time spending it over a few weeks rather, giving yourself a little bit more time to relax, recharge, and come back to it rather than feeling like you have to grind an interview prep. You may see other people around you that, are, that seem to be putting in like so many more hours and they're really just hammering out the interview prep. But that really leads to burning out a lot quicker and just worsening over time. Because just like anything in life, there's always a way to prep too much. And when you start prepping too much, then you kind of just, instead of actually improving, you just kind of start going downhill and burning out. And the worst thing you can do before your interview is showing up a little bit burnt out and not really having that energy anymore because they'll be able to pick that up very quickly and they'll see that you're kind of already burned out coming to the interview. And even regardless if they don't detect that, you obviously won't be able to put your best self forward and you won't be able to do your best work if you're coming to the interview burnt out rather than being able to actually give your own insight and your own energy to the interview day. And I have this last point as well. It's something I definitely believe in is sometimes rest can be as important, if not more important than the work itself. I definitely do attribute being able to get into medical school when I, when I was interview prepping because I was taking some of those rest days. I prepped a few times a week and when I wanted to prep one more time, I realized I was feeling a little bit burnt out that week. I was prepping a lot. I will just, maybe I'll do a little bit of prep, maybe even like half an hour and then I'll just stop or maybe even nothing at all that day. And I'll just relax and I'll just take it easy. And I found that when I did that, there was always a little part of me that was like, oh, am I prepping enough? But even after coming out of that break, I was able to prep a lot harder and also be able to have more energy while I was prepping and also being able to reflect and work harder when I actually came back to it. So I definitely recommend rest, resting and having those days where regardless of what happens, you're not going to do any work. You're just going to relax.
And one I general tip I also want to give, regardless of what interview you're doing, is to be honest. So this sounds a little silly, but I can illustrate this with an example. One common, very common situation, even if that's not asked on the interview, is people will prep with is something along the lines of you'll find your best friend cheating on a test. Maybe they're just doing something unethical or that are commonly perceived as unethical. And it asks, what do you do? So a lot of people will immediately say, they'll report them, they'll immediately go to the professor, they'll let them know that their best friend is cheating on a test or whatever, maybe they tell their supervisor that they're skipping work, something along those lines. But would they really in real life? I heavily doubt that they would. They, it's very unlikely that if you find your best friend doing something that even if you don't really agree with, that you would just immediately report them without talking to them at all. What would most likely happen is you would actually talk to them. You want to figure out what they're doing. Maybe try to talk them out of it and something along those lines. And many people wouldn't even report them even if they went through with it. It's definitely a lot better to be a lot more honest with the situation rather than trying to be some idealized version because that's not really who you are at all. And if you give them a genuine approach to what you would do and you back up exactly what you're going to do, not only are you just being genuine, but also you'll be able to come, they'll also be able to notice that you're not just saying a, a robotic answer that everyone expects should be the quote unquote right answer, but you're actually doing something that you would actually do. And you'll, you'll do something that you actually will follow up on. So I think definitely, instead of trying to answer a question based on what you think they would want to hear, Honestly, take a second to think, what would you really do in that situation? And now, so we're going to get a little bit into more specific information regarding to panels and MMIs. So one thing about a panel situation is what, so I have this point here because in a panel interview, questions may come a little bit rapid fire because you don't really have a time to think in an MMI. And so that is a weakness of the panel interview that they'll ask you a question. And normally you'll either be face-to-face -face or even virtually face-to-face, -face, quote unquote. So it might feel like you have to respond right away. But I definitely recommend, and especially from people that I know that are prepped for panel interviews, that the best one of the best things that they did, even especially on the day of, was just to take a second to think. So if they ask a question, that's a little bit different from what you're used to. And you may not have necessarily prepared for that taking a second or even literally saying that you're just going to take a second to think about that because it is a very important question, something even along those lines, just to let them know that you're going to take a second to think and then come back to the question and answer it is a lot better than trying to speak right away and just try to fill the space with the question that's just going to be rushed and not really well articulated or organized because having those being comfortable with those few seconds of silence will really have an answer that is better structured, more genuine, and also is just overall has better content as well. Now, on panels as well, it'll be a little bit hard to, and it's definitely something to practice as well, but try speaking to everyone there. So it seems a little silly, but when you're having a conversation, there's kind of a few people sitting around a table. It's really easy to just look at one person and really just speak to them. And while that person will feel really like spoken to and very listened to, everyone else will feel like they're not exactly being listened to or feels like you're only having a conversation with that one person. But you don't have to keep constantly looking at everyone or constantly making uh, verbally acknowledging every single person there. But while you're speaking, try to take a second, just look around the room, make everyone feel like you're speaking to them and almost presenting to them rather than just speaking to one of their colleagues at the table. And if someone else were to ask a question and answer, of course, maintaining eye contact with the person that's speaking, even if it's not the person directly in front of you and acknowledging that you're listening to them really helps you feel that you're speaking and engaging with everyone there rather than just kind of focusing on one person. It's a little bit difficult. So maybe if you're practicing online, you can maybe have multiple windows open. And so you can kind of look at each person and practice it that way. And if it's in person, you could almost sit in an arrangement where there's multiple people across the table and also have them kind of see if you're actually taking a second to look at other people rather than 
just focusing on one specific person when you're speaking. Finally, for I believe this is the final point for panel specific. One thing that's very important, especially in panels, is since this isn't uh, like an MMI where you'll be rotating to speak with someone else, you're basically going to have maybe an hour or so, depending on the interview itself, where you're just going to be talking with the same group of people. So although this isn't first impressions aren't completely vital, they are important. So a lot of panels will open up with very broad general questions, something maybe along the lines of tell me about yourself or tell us about a uh, time when like, uh, and so on and so forth. So especially during those first, those first one or two questions, especially when I would recommend, you take a second to really articulate what you're about to say and know exactly how you want to present yourself and what your narrative is gonna be. Because after that first or second question, that really sets the tone for what they'll expect later on. If your first few questions come out very rushed and very uh, not really well articulated, then it kind of sets up your later questions to not really be perceived as well. Even if you take a second to articulate them, have seeing that your first few answers were kind of rushed makes them believe that the rest of it's gonna be not really up to a higher quality or not really as organized. So knowing exactly how you want to answer those beginning questions is really important. It helps set the stage for putting you in a more positive light. So for panel specifics, uh, th these are a little bit more on the side of personal questions and things like that. So I wanted to put, share a specific strategy of course, although this is labeled as panel specific, you can of course use this for MMIs and other kinds of styles of interviews. So the share strategy I list here is very commonly, would be used mostly for if you're sharing some kind of personal situation. When you're answering personal questions, like you're telling us maybe about a, a time where you experienced a loss, a success, a conflict, so on and so forth. So share is of course an acronym and the S in share stands for situation. So of course, you're gonna describe exactly what happened, not going too long-winded into an explanation, but just let them know the general gist of what's happened. And for H in share is gonna be hindrances. So what are the challenges and well, hindrances that you encountered? So if this is a time of failure, maybe showing or demonstrating that you understood what got in the way of success. If this even was a story of success in the first place, maybe still what you did challenge on the way to succeeding and things like that. A is action. So when you have a story, of course, there were things that you did in that situation. There were, there were ways you reacted and ways that you progressed. Knowing exactly what you did and being able to explain, especially why you did those things is really important. So if you had a situation where you succeeded, being able to explain why you did those things, even if you weren't completely sure you would succeed, it really helps to claim, it helps to show a kind of a side of uh, introspection that you're able to reflect on what you're able to do, as well as being able to understand maybe where your flaws were. If this is a, fail, a story of failure, you can say that this is what you did, but then you're able to also reflect on that. And now you know maybe not to do something moving forward. Then R is results. So of course, the outcomes of your actions. If this is a story of failure, a time you experienced failure, then it'll be something along those lines. Maybe how did you fail? What did it affect? Success, conflict, and so on. What were the results of how it happened? The story, of course, doesn't have to be, doesn't necessarily have to have the most positive ending, especially if it's a time of failure. Even if it's a story where you experience conflict, even if the conflict wasn't necessarily resolved, having a solid story that you can uh, completely break it down with and explain what happened and what you learned can still be as valuable as a time where you may have uh, resolved a conflict, but it may, you may not have learned much from it. And of course, the E is evaluate. So of course, in the story you're telling them, there has to be something you took away from it. Because if you're spending all this time to tell them a story and you're answering the question, and at the end of the day, you didn't really know what you learned about it, or you didn't really change anything at all, then there wasn't really any point of the whole story. 
So the E is definitely one of the biggest, possibly the biggest part of the whole strategy in itself, or just anytime you're telling a story about yourself, because you have to show what you learned out of the situation and how that really impacted you moving forward. If you look at the story and you can't remember any way that it affected you, that's probably not the right story to tell. So knowing exactly what lesson you learned from it and how it impacted you moving forward is definitely important. And so this kind of strategy helps to kind of list out exactly how you want to break down the situation. But of course, once again, like I mentioned before, this is a strategy to experiment with, not to completely stick by. If you feel like you can tell stories in a way that doesn't fit this mold, of course, do that, because if it feels more natural, then just do that. And now moving on specifically to the MMI information. So in MMIs, uh, talking a little bit more, like I mentioned about timing, MMIs will have about two-ish minutes to prepare and about seven to eight minutes to talk. In those two minutes that you have to prepare, it is really important that you use it to the best of your ability. And what I mean by that is not only knowing exactly what you're going to say and thinking about how you want to structure that, but also expecting follow-ups, like I mentioned on the slide. So you have those two minutes to think about exactly how you want to answer. So knowing that you want to first talk about, let's say, X point, then move on and talk about something else, and then the third point that you're going to talk about. But then also, you maybe, if you do have extra prep time left over, you can also use that as a second to think about what could they follow up with you on. If there is an expected follow-up that you can think about, then it'll be more easy to talk about that and more easy to tackle that follow-up when, when they ask it. So if the follow-up that they ask maybe is a little bit more challenging, but you expected it during the prep time that you thought about it, then it'll be a lot easier to tackle rather than being completely blindsided. Of course, this is a definitely a strategy that takes time with doing. So if you need the full prep time, even just to formulate your answer, that's definitely completely more than fine. And that is something you'll develop over time as well. So there's no rush to try to expect and try to have your answer down completely in those maybe two minutes right off the gate. That will be a strategy you develop over time as well. Now, especially, of course, this applies to panels, but especially with MMI, you want to practice like it is the real thing. So like I, I kept mentioning the timings, and I'm repeating that a lot because I, it definitely is important to know exactly what that's going to look like. So having that image of your head, if it's virtual or in person, regardless, knowing exactly how much time you have to prep and how much time you have to answer, as well as time for follow-ups, is really important. Because if you're prepping like a panel-style interview and you walk into an MMI, you're really out of your depth there because it, you won't really have time you might have more time than you expected to think. You'll have maybe not enough time to talk. It'll be completely thrown off. But if you prep exactly what the interview day is going to look like, and that's something that I definitely made sure to incorporate in my uh, interview prep. So you know exactly how long it takes for you to talk about a certain topic, or you know you start to develop almost an internal clock to know that this is an appropriate amount of time to kind of talk for without rambling. So you can wrap up the point you're on and things like that to really make sure that you're practicing with that time constraint. Of course, kind of like what I was talking about on the last point, this isn't something you have to be able to nail right away. I know, especially at the beginning of my interview prep, the two minutes to prep didn't feel like very long. And even with that like eight-ish minutes to talk, I felt like I was talking way too quickly and I had way too much time left over. And I felt like, I didn't know what else to talk about, so I ended super early. So I think definitely right off the key, you don't have to exactly practice with this, but keeping it in mind that that's something you'll have to work towards. And by the end of your interview prep, it's definitely really important to be comfortable being able to have two minutes or so to read and that eight or so minutes to talk, with, include that, which may also include follow-ups. So if it includes follow-ups, definitely practice with that in mind and have whoever's prepping you or you're prepping with ask you follow-ups as well, just to get into that uh, comfortable, being able to be comfortable answering follow-up questions. So this is something that is a little bit uh, interesting in MMIs. 
And I'm not 100% sure how common this is in panels, but definitely for MMIs, depending on the school, there may be situations where you kind of have to act things out. So the situation may be something, maybe you're breaking bad news to a friend, you're managing some kind of conflict between people, or maybe you're working as a grocery store clerk and you maybe someone's having a bad day. Something like that. The situations themselves aren't super important, but what's happening and what's really important is the interview is kind of seeing like, how do you act obviously in a certain situation and how would you break bad news or how do you mediate a conflict? This depends exactly on the university. I know, for example, McMaster definitely has situations where you need to be comfortable with role playing and being able to kind of pretend to be a person in a situation rather than you're answering like you're speaking towards an interviewer. Because obviously if you're pretending to act something out and you speak to someone like they're an interviewer, it will be a little awkward. So it's definitely important to check with the university. They may have specific information on their website or maybe the contact email you can use, even just ask directly if there'll be role playing or some kind of element for that in the MMI. And once again, connecting that back to the preparation point, it's definitely really important, of course, if they're all role-playing situations to definitely get in the habit of preparing it. I know when I first was preparing, it was a very awkward at first because we had to pretend to be people in a situation and that felt a little silly, but after a little bit of prep, we got a little bit more used to it and it started to flow a little bit better. So I definitely recommend that regardless, you inc incorporate this into your prep if you know that it will be there. And I have this sub point as well. Even if you're a little, if you're a little bit unsure and you can't confirm or deny it, it's definitely good to at least have some prep in there. So if you're surprised with a bit of role playing, you know you've at least done a little bit that you can fall back on rather than just not prepping at all and being completely surprised. So one thing that for the MMI that I definitely very much relate to is on the day of the MMI, you'll have a station maybe that you'll think maybe you didn't do as well. This could be interview day itself. You'll think, oh, I didn't really give as strong as an answer maybe I could have. Or you're like, oh, I wish I said this on the station or this two stations ago. But what's really important is that you don't let that get to you. Because the mind game is especially important in an MMI. Because in a panel, you might be able to double back on a point because you're talking to the same people. But in an MMI, you have to leave and talk to someone else. So you can't really continue a conversation with someone that wasn't a part of it in the first place. So if you, you end the situation, you have to take a deep breath and move on and just keep going at it. I definitely, I, on a personal level, I definitely had moments in the MMI admin master that I thought I kind of was being like super awkward or like I didn't really answer it right. Or I had moments where my mic, for example, was kind of glitching out and it kind of cut me off a little bit. So it was both small and bigger things that really made me worry about if I was actually doing as well as I could have. But that part of that kind of two minute break, even that first like five seconds of the two minute prep that you have for another station, just taking a second, close your eyes, take a deep breath and just read the next situation and move on is really important because if you just let that get to you and it just keeps kind of keeping you down the whole rest of the session, then that really affects all of your answers. So regardless, even if you mess up on one station, knowing that you have like seven, depending, maybe seven-ish other stations to do, and you'll have all seven other people interviewing you, it definitely doesn't mean that you won't get in. And finally, now I had a point on the virtual kind of modified I think it was virtual modified personal interview. I think that's what the acronym was. I, I wanted to put a note for this because I know UFT and possibly other places well have this kind of newer new form of the interview. So uh, in terms of these, just like them, it might be one-to-one. -one. I, got, I got this quote specifically from UFT just to make sure I would be giving the right information. So the raters of the interview that you'll be working with, the people interviewing you. That would include physicians, medical students, residents, health professionals, and community members. So like what I was talking about before, for some places it might not be unsure, but for here, they straight up said there will be community members. So there may be someone not directly in healthcare, but that, that might still be tied to the school. 
in order to kind of give a more holistic kind of interviewing profile. And what's really interesting about this one is for the other MMI panels, of course, you would expect to be synchronous. Someone asks you a question and you just respond to them. But what is, I guess, I'm not sure if it's better or worse, but they, at U of T, they'll ask you the questions basically asynchronously. So it'll kind of just be like questions that pop up. You take about, I, I believe it's about, I think it's somewhere around two to three minutes. Again, kind of like an MMI, like two to three minutes, like think about. And then you have just a short period of time. I think it was five-ish minutes. I think, yeah, it says right here, the video response is about five minutes in length. So about five minutes to just answer. And since it's asynchronous, once you record yourself answer, you just kind of ship it off and you go. So one way you can prep for that is just getting in the habit of just recording yourself. Just having a question that you know you're gonna to respond to, record yourself and then listen back to it. And maybe even sending it to other people that you're prepping with just to get them to look at it too. Just so on the day of, it doesn't feel too uncomfortable just speaking to your computer and not to anyone else. So you kind of have that comfort already there. Again, the questions asked, of course, they're, they'll be very kind of similar to what MMI is at panels and such. You know, expect personal ethical questions, some healthcare may be in there as well. Of course, and pretty much like an MMI, you'll have a variety of questions. And so prepping with a variety of questions is really important. And yeah, so this last point here, just about common questions, of course, regardless of who you're talking about to interview prep, they'll always tell you there is these very common questions to answer. So why medicine, strengths, weaknesses, personal stories, uh, tell them about yourself and why this school. These are just some of the very, very common, like the top of the pile of common questions. Not that I'm saying that they're not important, but at the same time, it is important to make sure that you start off with these, but don't feel like you have to have some magical, perfect answer to these questions. Because sometimes at the end of the day, not only is it very uncommon sometimes to even be asked some of these questions, but at the same time, being able to be comfortable with the fact that your situations or what you've experienced are enough and being able to know that the stories and experiences that you have are good enough to be able to say that you've experienced a loss or this is a strength is really important because sometimes you might hear that you might come across a story that's like, oh, wow, this story is like so amazing. I can see why they ended up in medicine. Like maybe my story doesn't sound as good compared to them, but that's not really doing yourself a service because if you're applying and you made it this far, then you definitely deserve to be able to say that you can up, you are interested in medicine, you have strengths and weaknesses, but regardless, that can keep you forward. And as a last note, if you want to practice these questions again further, I can shamelessly plug my packages. So again, you can look on my profile as well specifically. I have special different packages for specific one hour sessions, specifically prepping for Casper, a uh, block for is dedicated interview prep and application prep as well. Some of the Casper and application prep may not be as directly necessary right now because you may have already completed those parts, but the hour sessions and interview prep may be a little bit more relevant during this time. So thank you so much for listening to this seminar. Definitely reach out to me on acceptedtogether.com if you have any further questions. And of course, we have some time left over at the end. So if there are any questions in the chat, I can answer them now. I'll just open the chat as well. Oh, okay, I got a good question. So, the question is, in your opinion, what makes a great answer stand out from a good answer? That is a very good question. <laughs> so I would say what really makes it stand out is, I, th I think when you're answering the question, the content of course is really the most important in the question of course. And I think what really takes it from a good to a great is not only is the content, but also, I'm having an issue trying to word this right, but in the content of the answer, I think that being able to be a lot more personable and how you 
not only how you relate to the situation at hand, but also being able to acknowledge that you're, you have some information or maybe you'll have a lack of information in the situation is really what takes it to another level. Because when you have someone answering a question, it's very obvious when someone's answering it, but they're very disconnected from the problem or they're very uninterested or they have no experience in it. Or, and it's very different from someone that can, even if they're not experiencing it with it, they can acknowledge that, yeah, I don't have experience in this, in this, but I'm interested to learn more. I'm interested in seeing this because I know other people that have experienced it, or you have kind of, maybe, maybe you do have experience in something, being able to connect it back to you personally, even if the personal connection isn't super strong, does definitely take it a little bit further because at the end of the day, someone that's interviewing maybe like 50 people in one day, they'll remember the ones that were more so along the lines of, oh, this person was really interesting. I like hearing about the experience and when I asked them about this question or they felt like they were really genuine with it. Even though they didn't know as much about the situation, they seemed like they really wanted to learn more. They may learn more after this. They may look into it more after this interview as well. So I think definitely that is one thing that can really take it to the next level as well. There are some other things, of course, that are important, but they could still be in a good answer is things like, structure and things like that. Of course, that's that's in both a good and a great answer, but I think that person and ability is really what takes to the next level. And I got a few questions now in the chat. So yeah, at Western, I grad, you can graduate with a three-year degree. In my situation, I thought I would be uh, graduating with a three-year science degree, but unfortunately I was missing like a 0. 0.5 in one credit. So instead of doing the 0.5 credit over the summer, because I, I really wanted to relax over the summer, uh, I just graduated with three-year BA as well. So with it, graduating with a degree is, I think it varies slightly by school, because I know McMaster like, doesn't really care. Like You could be listed as a dropout, and that's technically fine. Like you, the, I know for McMaster, it really doesn't matter what you did beforehand, as long as you have like those requirements to apply in the first place. I think depending on the school, if you're able to apply in third year regardless, I don't think it matters exactly what degree you have, but it might not hurt to just double back with the school because obviously I can only speak to McMaster comfortably. So just double check with the schools just to make sure. The three-year BA that I got, I, I feel like if you're applying in third year, you should be able to get regardless, but just of course, email at, if you're at Western, you can email the registrar office just to make sure if you were to graduate, like, are you able to graduate within like a certain degree? And the acting stations at McMaster. So the, I, I can't obviously can't speak to exactly what the content of the, the stations were, but what it would look like was you would enter a room, there would be one person uh, that's an actor. So they wouldn't be evaluating you. They would just be playing a part. So maybe it's like a friend, maybe it's a random stranger, so on and so forth. And then there would be a second person that's not in, like in the situation, they're not acting, but they're just evaluating. So they're essentially just watching you speak to the actor and they're evaluating you, but the actor will not be evaluating. They'll just be playing a part and they'll just kind of be talking to you directly. So you'll be talking kind of to the actor but, and you're really, you're almost, since it's online, you, you, there won't really be like a sort of body language element to it. But I imagine if this is in person, you would almost be like almost ignoring the interviewer and just talking to the actor because the interviewer is technically not part of the situation. So group stations, I had it online. So I, I believe McMaster would still be doing it online. So there was no group stations for us. The closest thing we had to like a group environment was like beforehand. There's like a sort of like orientation call. So you're in like small groups and you're kind of chilling with some people like a little bit beforehand, almost like a waiting room, quote unquote. But yeah, there was no dedicated group stations. Of course, I would definitely recommend just checking with the university again, just to make sure if that changes, because there's a chance it changes, but I, I, I doubt it would, but just, of course, double check with the university. And the question that helped most with preparation, I would say... I don't think I can point to one thing that prepped the most, but I would say like a few things that prepped the most. Uh, 
so I would say the few things that I would say helped me the most was one, like a relatively consistent prep schedule, knowing that like, for example, like one of the days that I would prep my group was pretty much always like Thursdays. So regardless, I know like, okay, like Thursday evening, I always have like an hour and a half set aside regardless. Like, even if I'm a little busy that day with schoolwork, I know an hour and a half is cut out and I'm just going to prep like that evening for a little bit. And then if I'm prepping a little bit more then just knowing uh, like, okay, the, that time I'm just going to have that blotted out. Secondly, a uh, thing that helped me was, of course, I mentioned this before, but taking a second to rest, taking a day off of interview prep to rest was especially important because it'll feel, I definitely understand if it, like if you, it'll feel awkward at first to be like, oh, you know, I could be prepping right now, but I'm just taking it easy and you might feel bad. But honestly, that is the one of the best things you can do for you in that situation. Of course, there's a balance between like relaxing a little bit too much, but at the same time, taking like a day off in the middle of your interview prep will only serve to help you. And I do think that was really important. And finally, I see the third thing. So I would say these are more like three things that help me the most is definitely like I mentioned this tip before, but prepping like it's the real thing. So on the day of, on the interview stations, obviously you can't prep for it exactly, exactly being the same thing. But I know that every time I got a situation, I was super comfortable with knowing that I only have two minutes to answer and then the eight minutes to, or sorry, two minutes to think and the eight minutes to answer, including follow-up. Having that down and knowing that you're super comfortable with thinking for two minutes and having that eight minutes speak and also answer follow-ups is really important because if you're not comfortable with that, then you'll kind of be thrown off a little bit on interview day. And so if your mic glitches out and, okay, so yeah, if you're, Mike glitches out, should you ask the interview if you should repeat yourself? I believe, depending on the platform that they use, I think the platform will use like mic tests and things like that, like before you even do the interview, just to make sure your microphone's working. Obviously, if the day of something happens, the interview, I, I hopefully they would tell you if your mic is glitching out. If there's any reason for you to believe that it is, just take a second and just be like, sorry, I'm just going to like cut myself off for a second just to see like, if there's any issue, like if you see your screen glitching out for a second, just taking a second to say like, oh, I know it's my screen glitching out. I just want to make sure I'm not cutting out or anything. Just that even one second just to make sure and just move on is definitely fine. And approach. So the tell your, how, how do you approach the tell me about yourself question? So that is, that's definitely a great question. I would say, in, I mean, I don't have unfortunately too much time to talk about this so I can kind of summarize it. I would say the tell me about yourself questions should definitely have a mix of, obviously there will be the quote unquote cliche, like you'll have an element of like, why you're, you know, why did you come this far? Why did you apply? There'll be an element of the like extracurriculars and such, but also it's a really important time to talk like about yourself. And what I mean by that is like hobbies and things like that. If you answer that question and they come out of it, like, okay, I know you're like, like you're applying to med school. And I know like what your extracurriculars are, but at the same time, they can just read your application and see that. So having that as an opportunity to go beyond your application and say like, okay, I learned something that wasn't just like listed on his like resume or his application. And like, I know this person a little bit better now. Like for example, maybe something you may not have, like, this is obviously hypothetical, but like, let's say you were really interested in like music, like you've performed, but like, that's not on your application. That's a great thing to talk about yourself on the interview day because they can come out and be like, oh, that was like a really interesting person. Like they, you know, they did X, Y experience, they like performed and that wasn't listed on their application, but I got to know them a little bit better. So having that element in there is really important. And it's really a great way of introducing yourself to a speaker or like the interviewer to let them know like, okay, you're applying to medicine, so you're interested for this reason, but especially like, who are you like as a person? Like, what do you like to do? What are your interests and so on? The next question, it's a little similar. Okay, so about a tell yourself question. If you want to talk about different hobbies, interests, et cetera, should you weave them together into a common theme or is it okay to talk about a few unrelated topics? I, I think it's definitely fine if they don't completely, completely relate. At the same time, it is best, of course, like try to record yourself answering that question or even practice that with other people and kind of experiment with both like try weaving it together, maybe present it as a common theme and then try like a few unrelated. And then if you're recording yourself, listen it back or if you're just prepping with someone, like have them 
kind of like evaluate and be like, okay, like, were you able to follow that through? Did you, did you feel like that was really letting them know about someone? Like, was there a, one of the two ways that worked better? Because for some people, a lot, so for some people, their experiences may have a common theme or maybe one or two themes, but for some people, their application may look a little bit like slightly scattered in that sense of so like, they might not have a clear theme. And that doesn't necessarily mean one stronger than the other. It just means how are you going to like present that? And just practicing both ways of being able to present it is, I think, really important. So whatever way works better, obviously, it if it works best for you, then just keep doing that. And for virtual interviews, can you see the question you're, you're answering or does it leave the screen? Okay, yeah, that's a great question. So I can, I can really only speak to McMaster. I imagine it's relatively the same, but for McMaster, after that two minutes of period is up, the question basically just disappears and you're speaking to the person. So of course, for whatever, I, I don't imagine the prompts would be crazy long or anything. For McMaster, of course, the prompts were short enough that you would definitely remember what the prompts were. Like they weren't paragraphs that they asked you for to like to memorize when you answer the question. It'll probably be like a few sentences max. So it shouldn't be an issue in terms of remembering the prompt. But I imagine if for whatever reason, like you can't remember exactly what was in there, I'm pretty sure the interviewer will still like have the prompt with them, I believe. So you can just double check with them as well. And uh, da, da, da. someone asked, are you allowed to have a pen and paper and write stuff down? Okay, that's also a good question. So I, it depends slightly by school. I don't believe McMaster was completely fine with that. I, it, it is something that varies by per school. I remember when I was applying, there was also that we were all wondering that as well because it's virtual. And I think McMaster either directly put out a statement or like someone emailed them or something or like I emailed them, I don't remember. But it's definitely, if, if you look on the website and it's not like 100% stated, like are you allowed to write stuff down during the interview date? It's best to just try contacting the university. Like there'll probably be some kind of like admissions or interview email or something you can use. And if you just, if they're like not getting back to you and you don't have any information, then assume you can't because assuming you can is definitely a lot more dangerous because if you're, if you get used to that and then you prep and they're like, you're not allowed to do this on the day of, then you're in a bad situation. So if you're unsure, then I would just err on the caution of not doing it. But if you're allowed to, then yeah, do whatever you want. Like you can write it or not. So someone asked, how do you structure a good why medicine answer? So that is really interesting. That is a, a, obviously a good question. And I would say that's a part of the, uh, the question itself is the part of the reason why it's really difficult. And I'll, I found it very difficult for a long time is I didn't know how to structure it for a while. And I think the, I, I guess a, both a pro and a con of the question itself is the structure isn't obviously the same for each person because at like a, someone, two people that are giving a really genuine why medicine answer may have very different ways in which they structure it. So one person may have like a really good like personal story that they carried through with them and like that was a theme of their life. But another person may like, they may not necessarily have a strong personal story, but they were like, oh, through these extracurriculars, that's how I got interested in medicine. And like those two aren't necessarily, like one's not really better than the other. Although there's like a bias towards like, there's people like perceive like personal stories as like being so much better, quote unquote, but like those two aren't really better than each other, like at all. If you can present one, like if you can, you can present both as equally being good and both of those people can still have solid answers. So it does depend on how you structure it. If someone did ask me if I'm be willing to share why my why medicine answer. So I won't complete, I'll, I'll give you pretty much what I said without completely, completely saying it. So the way I structured it was a lot actually more so on the extracurricular side. I didn't have a lot of like personal like life story because I think that was also an issue of why I answered that question because when I was trying to think about an answer, I was like, oh, I don't have like that personal story. You know, like I didn't like, uh, I didn't like have a doctor role model or like I didn't like have that experience like as a child that it involved me in medicine. So like, I think that was why I felt like really unsure about how I structured it. And the way I approached the question instead was through my extracurriculars and what did I want to get out of medicine? So in my, across my extracurriculars, what I did and the themes that I wanted to carry into medicine were things like advocacy, 
things like teaching, things like learning, but like those kinds of like, I would say more so the teaching and advocacy part. And also the, instead of learning, actually, I would say the more accurate to what I actually said would, or what I would say is advocacy, teaching, and then kind of like uh, communication, problem solving, like leadership. Like those themes that I got across my extracurriculars that I wanted to continue, I found that that was uniquely combined like in a career in medicine. And that, that's pretty much like what my why medicine answer was. In mid McMaster, they didn't actually end up asking me why, but obviously I still like prepped a little bit just to like know what I would say. And that was like what I would say is that in like what I wanted to do in medicine, it's uniquely combined to have like a certain aspect of traits rather than have, obviously I still had personal experiences I could relate these themes to, but also it wasn't like a life story of like, since I was like five or something, like I, I didn't have that. Obviously I'm not downplaying anyone that does like, it might sound like that. And I apologize if I do, because of course those stories are really important. And that's not to just dis- like, obviously if you have those stories, use them, of course. And those stories are equally valid, but I'm just saying I didn't have that story. So of course I couldn't just make one up. And so I relied more so on structuring it, like a little bit more of like extracurriculars and in terms of themes of what I wanted to continue with. So I think that obviously there could be other ways of structuring that answer too. I feel like the best way to do it again is just experimenting. Like try to just answer the question. Maybe maybe you try writing it down in advance or even just try answering the question and just see where it gets to. And just try to be genuine about it and kind of see like how, what you get comfortable with. Maybe try experimenting with that like themes and extracurricular wise if you don't have as much of a personal story. If you have a personal story, try implementing that and kind of seeing like how that gets you. And yeah, that was a slightly long-winded answer, but yeah. I think we are a little over time. I mean, that's fine because I did kind of crash slightly through. So that kind of made up for it a little bit. So I think I will, if there's, I'll give one more second for questions as well, of course. But if there are no questions, I'll just wait a second. And then if not, we can call that a day. Hey, I guess there are no questions. So have a good rest of the day, everyone. And yeah, if you have any questions, reach out to me on acceptedtogether.com and we can definitely uh, talk more about it if you have any questions. Hey, have a good rest of the day, everyone. See you.